Well, what seems like about six years ago, uh, we started a study going through Colossians. Uh, and if you're like me, 13 weeks in 2020 feels like six years. Amen? All right. So, uh, but today is kind of that day that everybody's been like anticipating and waiting for. Uh, it's that day that we finally kind of bring Colossians to an end. It's the day that uh, some of you thought would probably never come, right? Uh, we have literally, if you have been with us, we've been in Colossians for 13 weeks now. And so 13 weeks is a long time to be studying one book of the scriptures. Uh, but I'm going to tell you, I hope it's been as profitable for you as it has been for me. Because I have never, uh, in all my years of ministry, I've never preached through Colossians. I've read Colossians, but I've never studied Colossians the way I've studied it over the last 12 weeks, 13 weeks. And so uh, this has been incredibly profitable for me. And let me just add this as well. Uh, if you've not been with us during this 13-week study, I highly encourage you uh, to go into our YouTube page or our Facebook page and get caught up. Um, not all of our messages are on our YouTube page, unfortunately. Uh, we have technical difficulties sometimes, and we don't always get a recording uh, to actually record. Or there's no audio or just something crazy happens. Uh, but what's not on YouTube is on our Facebook Live page. You can um, either worship through the music or you can fast forward through the music and get to the teaching. Uh, but I highly encourage you to go and, and be a part of that because what Paul has done in four chapters is he spent a lot of time in chapters one and two dealing with the supremacy of Christ and who Christ is. There's a lot of theology, if you will, that God gives and those are, that Paul gives in those first two chapters. And then as he moves on into chapters three and four, he gives a ton, I'm talking a ton of practical advice. And so that's what we've been in the last few weeks is the, the practicality of it. So if you've got your Bible with you, open it up to Colossians chapter four for the very final message in this series uh, titled uh, Becoming an Effective Missionary. Uh, when we were back praying this morning, I, I just told our team, I said, this is one of those texts that explains why we're here. Amen. We're not here just to gather and eat donuts and drink coffee and give air hugs. Sorry, Brandon, I know air hugs are not your thing, but that's where we're at right now. Uh, but th that's not why we're here. We're here to be encouraged by the scriptures, right? And we're here to, to learn how do I live this out practically? That's, that's, that's my goal as your pastor is to teach you how to live out the scriptures practically. Um, I didn't grow up in church, and so for me, I just thought the Bible was some old, outdated thing that had no impact on my life, had no uh, relativity to my life. And then as I got to study it, I realized, wow, there is so much application, even thousands of years later, if you understand how to read this. And so I kind of made it my life goal to help interpret, and, and not because I'm smart, but because other people that I read are smart. And help you with this. And so what Paul does is he spends about four verses giving what I think are three fail-proof ways to be a more effective missionary. In other words, a more effective Christian doing our job and going and sharing Jesus with other people, right? That's our goal here. Um, and then he spends the very end of that saying his goodbyes. And let me just say this, starting in verse 7, we're not going to go down that way. But if you want to, uh, go and read that sometime at the very end, his final greetings. That is what brotherhood looks like. If you want to know what is what is truly like brotherhood, man, go read that. Because, man, Paul is like just giving it to his buddies, right? And so that's what that looks like. And so if you've got your Bible, hopefully you found uh, Colossians 4. If you've been with us, hopefully you just turned to your bookmark. And let me read verses 2 through 6 uh, as we close this out. He says this. He says, devote yourself to prayer and stay alert in it with thanksgiving. At the same time... Pray also for us that God may open a door for us for the word to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains, so that I may make it known as I should. Act wisely towards outsiders, making the most of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you should answer each person. So let, let me just say this. Hopefully, as I just read that, you're like, oh, all you know is three points. Because I'm just, I'm not here to trick you, like, right? Like, this isn't rocket science. And so the three things that we're going to go over today, uh, they're, they're not rocket science. I think Paul lays them out pretty clearly and pretty plain, plainly. Um, but I want you to notice this thing that he continues to talk about. Uh, he, he says, where is it here in verse 3? Um, to speak the mystery of Christ. And we talked about that somewhere around week 5 or 6, the mystery of Christ. Like, man, there's a mystery there that shouldn't be a mystery. Like, Jesus came to die for you. Like, I want my friends who don't know Christ to know that Jesus died for you. 
so that they can turn their lives around and begin to live for Christ and go and spend eternity with me in heaven one day. But I think there's some incredible, incredible insights that Paul gives right here if we're going to be effectively expanding the kingdom of God. And so when I talk about the kingdom this morning, you got to understand what I'm talking about is heaven, right? That is God's eternal spot, right? Um, so when we talk about being kingdom focused and kingdom minded, we're talking about having heaven on our mind and that should be our goal. And so let's look at these three simple steps to becoming an effective missionary. And number one is to be intentional about prayer. To be intentional about prayer. Now listen to me. He says it here um, that uh, he says, for which I have been changed in the end of verse three. If I'm in prison, right, and I'm praying, my prayer is probably going to sound a lot like your prayer, right? God, get me out of here, right? I don't want to be here anymore. Get me out of here. But that's not way Paul prays. Paul, Paul's, Paul's prayer is not limited to the, the temporal circumstances that he's in, right? Back in the summer, we walked through Philippians verse by verse, and we talked about how the whole theme of Philippians is joy. And then throughout Philippians, Paul is talking about regardless of your circumstances, you can have joy. And how do we know? Because he's in prison writing this letter to us. Not to us, but to the Philippian church, right? And so you can have joy regardless of your circumstances. Well, here he is again, wrongly accused. He's in prison. He's writing this letter. And he's like, hey, church in Colossae, who's dealing with these false teachers and these people who are liars and they're trying to get you to turn away. Let me give you some theology and then let me give you some practical steps to not fall away. And so one of the things he says is to have this deep prayer life. Look back at verse 2. Devote yourselves to prayer. Like I told you, this weren't going to be hard, right? So if you want to be an effective missionary, devote yourselves to prayer. Stay alert in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open a door to us for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, which I am in chains. Pray that God would open doors so I can share Christ with people. Like, let me tell you something. That's not hard. We should be praying for God to open doors so that we can share Christ with other people. When I was at Liberty Heights Church 2013 to 2017, uh, one of the things that was one of our goals was to have 10% of the church on mission, to go on a mission trip. And, and Liberty Heights has been rapidly growing for years and years and years. So at the time, we were running right around 900 people. And so this was in 2016, and our goal uh, set by Pastor Brad was, hey, let's take 10% on mission. And I wish you could have been in some of those meetings. We had a trip going to Africa. We had a trip going to Guatemala, a trip to uh, Colorado, Boston, and Detroit, Michigan. And so I had the honor every year of leading the trip to Detroit, Michigan. Um, uh, Matt always went to Detroit with me. That was like my partner in crime. We, Matt and I, this is awesome. Matt and I would, would create... Um, scouting trips to Michigan, to Detroit for like two days. And like, like we got to go plan out our mission trip, right? And so we would go up there and spend time with our partners and just figure out what we were doing. It was the greatest times. But I wish you could sit in some of those meetings because we got to like 81, 82 people signed up to be on mission. And we were in, in these back rooms like, like okay, we got to get nine more people. How can we just get nine more people to get on a mission trip? Well, if I can get two families of five to go on a mission to Detroit, we hit our goal, right? That's not hard. It's a three-hour drive. We're good here. And so you may think, wow, you're just chasing numbers. But I want you to see the other side of what a church staff does behind the scenes. Sometimes when we're chasing numbers, we're trying to do discipleship. If our purpose is to make disciples who are gathering, growing, giving, and going, if one of our purposes is going, right? then we want you to go. We want you to understand what it looks like to be on a mission trip, to go and be a part of that. That's how we're going to try and disciple you. So yeah, it is a numbers game party, but the other side of it too is we want people to go and experience that. We ended up taking over, I think we took 52 people to Detroit that year. <coughs> families. I think we had 94, 95 people on mission. We hit our goal. It was incredible. And I'm going to tell you, while we were there, I could tell you story after story. I remember one time, uh, Matt, I think this was the trip you were on. I can remember one time we were cleaning up this neighborhood. you got to understand Detroit. Like every other house is burned out, boarded up, locked out, grass this tall. It's just a mess. And I can remember one trip, we were just there to clean up the neighborhood and do a block party. We want to show you how much we love you guys by cleaning up your neighborhood. And then we just want to have a party on the last night we're here. You know, inflatables, all this stuff. So this one day, I'll never forget, it was, like, it was something out of a movie. These three guys come walking down the middle of the road. One dude's pushing a lawnmower. One dude has a, a weed eater over his shoulder. And the other dude has a rake over his shoulder. 
And it's almost like they're in slow motion. They're just walking down the street, right? And I'm like, this is kind of crazy. Now listen, the other thing you got to know about when we go in Detroit, this is the neighborhood we're not allowed to be in when the sun goes down. Like when the sun goes down, you got to go to your hotel. You can't be here, right? Uh, and so these three men come walking down the street and they just pick a yard and they just start cleaning up. And we're like, this is incredible. And so we took a break for lunch. And I remember sitting there and I was like, so meet no I was like, so why, what made you guys come down here? And he's like, listen, if you care about our block, we care about our block. And I just thought, man, how cool. Like how cool to see these guys getting connected. And then they showed up that night to the block party and they showed up to church on Sunday. Like it, was, it was incredible the way this kind of domino effect started to take place. And I can tell you story after story after story like that. But the true thing that took place was the people, the 52 or 53 people that were on mission that year, the devotions that, that they sat in at nighttime, reflecting on the day, going through different verses that deal with why we're here, why are we doing what we're doing? And then waking up the next morning after getting up and, and, and spending more time in devotion, praying about the day to come, and going through a few more questions about where's my mindset, where's my focus gonna be today? And then we'd go have breakfast, and then we'd sit down after breakfast, and we would talk about what we did in our devotion the night before and what we did the devotion that morning. Because what we were doing is we were praying, we were asking God to open our eyes, to open our ears to the things and the needs around us. Listen to me, church. You don't have to be on a mission trip to do that. When we talk about getting focused and, and type, having kingdom prayer, you can sit right here in Franklin, Ohio, and spend time in God's Word at the end of your day and think about the things that God did around you. You can wake up the next morning and spend five, ten minutes not just, just praying like, oh, pray for, you know, my drive and no traffic and pray for a good, good cup of coffee from Dunkin' today and, and, and whatever, you know, pray for no big line at Starbucks. Like, but instead, pray for the, the, the major things. Like, God, hey, would you open a door for me today to share the gospel with somebody? Would you help me to build a relationship today that as I build this relationship and continue to build this relationship with this person, that maybe they'll ask me, hey, what's different about you? Why, why are you a little bit different than everybody else so I can share my story with them? You see, the greatest detriment to being kingdom effective and missional living is non-missional mindset. Listen, you don't have to get on a bus or a plane or drive three hours away to go on a mission trip. You don't have to do that to have a missional mindset. And so if you want to be a detriment to the kingdom, then spend your life, church, listen to me, you ready? Spend your life with no kingdom on focus thoughts. It's hard to stay in a missionary mindset when you're here, I get it. Because we begin to slip back into routine, right? And maybe on Sunday it's pretty easy. Like we get encouraged, we go out, we hear the word, but then all of a sudden we go back and we're like, now I have to get back into the routine. And Pastor Sean said, I gotta be praying about certain specific things. So like, is it, is it wrong to, to pray for sick people? No, that's intercession prayer. Is it wrong to pray about your own needs? No, that's, that's petition. God tells us to pray with petition, right? It's not wrong to pray through those things. But make sure at some time during that time when you're praying for other people or you're praying for your own needs, that you're also praying for God to push back the darkness and have a kingdom focus and let the glory of God be shown through you. That's what it looks like. Because here's the deal. If kingdom power or kingdom prayer never makes it into your prayer life, then there's a chance that's never going to make it into your heart. And you know I preach on the heart a lot because if it never breaks it into your heart, listen to me, it's never going to make it into your actions. And the Bible says, blessed are the hands and for those who are the hands and feet of Christ, taking the good message. So we've got to have it in, in, imparted into our prayer life so it goes into our heart, so it goes into our actions. And so when the Bible tells us to pray without ceasing, or our song when it says to, in everything by prayer and supplication, let your request be made known to God. This is the idea of that continual prayer. This is the idea of staying focused on the things that are around me, the people that are around me that don't know Jesus, of me asking God to open doors, to build relationships, to do all these things. And so as I see something good happening, I just, hey God, man, that was, that was awesome. What I just witnessed right there, that was really cool. Thank you for, for that. 
Or, or when I see something not so great, I can have a quick response and say, man, uh, God, would you inter- involve yourself in that situation? That, that's a bad deal right there. Would you involve yourself over there? Like that, That's what we're talking about. That's what it looks like to pray without ceasing. And so right here when he says devote yourselves to prayer in verse 2, the Greek here, understand the Greek, is talking about being courageous, bold, and persistent. Amen. So let me ask you this question. This is going to stick on it. What was the last time you were courageous in your prayer life? What was the last time you were bold when you prayed? What was the last time when you prayed for something so big that you just knew God couldn't do it? That's what, that's what we're talking about. I, I was taken to lunch by a, a guy this week. He said, hey, I, I love seeing what's going on in your church. Can I take you to lunch? And I said, yeah. And he's an Australian guy. And so I love sitting and talking with him. Uh, but one of the things he talked about, he talked about another guy named Clint who taught him about prayer. He said, always make sure that when you pray, you pray as something that just seems impossible for God to do. And I thought, man, that's huge. Because when God does it, you can't take the credit. Right? You can't take the credit for it. Only God can take the credit for it. And so we're talking about praying and being burdened until God does something. I'm going to share with you something I've been burdened about, that I've been praying about, and I'm going to keep praying about it until God does something. You know that the three big things we've been praying about this year in 2020 at the Journey Community Church was that God would use the people in these seats to reach more people for Christ. Right? That's number one. That God would uh, allow us as the church to trust him more with our generosity so that as we approach year five in the church, that we can be self-funded and not have to rely on outside supports. Right? So that was number two. Number three, we've been praying for God to show us and provide a place of permanent worship for us if that's somewhere other than the YMCA. And so we've been, we've been, these have been my three bigs this year. And the one that I've been so burdened about is number one, is that we in the church would reach more and more people for the gospel. I can't tell you how many people that walk into our church and I spend time with them, I talk to them and I say, so how'd you find out about us? Oh, well, I saw this big event you did on Facebook. Oh, cool. Um, I was at one of your uh, outreach events and thought, man, this is something different about this group. I wanna come check out this church. Uh, moved to the area pretty new and we've been driving all over town. I see signs everywhere. So I thought I would look it up and be like, what, what is this Journey Community Church? Cool. Uh, I work out at the YMCA. I saw you have a sign in your lobby uh, that the church meets here. So we thought we'd come check it out. Awesome. And the one thing I don't hear very often, I hear it some. Well, my neighbor goes to your church and they've been invited me. My coworker comes to church here, and they've been invited. Actually, can I tell you one that just blows my mind? I'm not going to call anybody out, but I heard one two or three weeks ago that said my coworker told me to come to church here. Coworker doesn't come to church here. We got people who don't come to church here saying, you need to go to the Journey Community Church. That's either a good thing or a bad thing. I hadn't decided yet. But I don't know. And so that's one of the things that I've been burdened about. How do we get our church to go, okay, you've got to come see what God's doing here. You've got to come with me. I'll buy you whatever. you just got to get involved, and you've got to come see what God's doing here. And so you know what I've done? I wasn't going to share this, but I'm going to share it. Um, I, I basically have created a list of questions that I would love to know how our church does when somebody walks in the door. And I've enlisted some people in the community that I've been wanting to come to our church and I said, hey, would you come be a secret shopper at our church? Would you just show up and, and just check it out, fill out this sheet, and then just give it to me, mail it to me, whatever. I want to know how we're doing. And my goal is twofold. Number one, I want to make sure that we're friendly, right? When people walk into our church, that they don't just come in and sit down and nobody ever talks to them. I went to church in Tennessee with Don and Sherry Lynn when I was there in October, and that's a pretty large church. We didn't get talked to by one person. The pastor, that was it. I was like, dude, I'm a family of seven walking up in here. Like, if I see a family of seven walking, I'm going to be like, hey, like, Roy the Man of Glass, you're not leaving this church. That's seven, all right? You know what you call people with four kids? Quitters. All right, I'm just, oh, that was, that was good. But anyway, 
And so it just kind of made me think, like, what, 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 do we, what if that happened to the journey? What if somebody walks in and, and, and they spend an hour, hour and 15 minutes with us, and nobody ever spends any time saying, hey. So my other goal with this, I told you it's twofold. My other goal is that the people who are secret shoppers may go, man, why have I waited so long to come? I'm going to keep coming. It's just the way my brain works sometimes. We've got to be kingdom focused in our prayer time. We, we've got to be focused on those things that we're so burdened about that we're going to stay burdened until we see God move. And this church is one of those things for me. The second step is pretty simple, but you may want to write it down. It comes out of verse 5. Don't do dumb things. Look at verse 5. Look what he says. Act wisely <laughs> towards outsiders, making the most of the time. My translation, don't do dumb things. Like, I think if Paul could have just said that, he probably would have. But he's like, hey, I'm going to be a little bit, you know, better. Do I need to interpret this one? Are we good to just, like, kind of move on? Just listen to me. Whether we like it or not, we live in a very skeptical culture. In our culture today, truth is relative. It's not objective. And our actions are crucial to the credibility of the message that we can't claim that we believe in. And so if we claim we love Jesus, and we claim that our life is going to be set on, on, on reflecting Christ to, to the nations, to the community, to wherever, then our actions have got to follow suit. We talk about that a lot. You've ever heard that saying, you're, let my actions speak louder than my words? Well, there's another one that goes along with it that says, your actions speak so loud I can't hear what you're saying. Man, I don't want to be that guy. I'm just going to throw that out there. I don't want to be the guy that my actions speak so loud people won't even listen to me. And so when Paul says in verse 5, wisely toward outsiders making most of the time we've got to understand what he's talking about we talk about wisdom wisdom is properly evaluating circumstances and biblical wisdom is making godly decisions so that you can represent Christ better to those who don't know him it's godly wisdom I want to make decisions that way my life represents Christ better to those who don't know Think about the Colossian believers. How did they advertise their faith? They had no church building. They had no big steeple, no big cross. They didn't have billboards. They didn't have stupid church signs like this one right here. Like, uh, let me just... What? Like, let me just tell you. If God ever blesses us with a church one day, we're not having a marquee. If you don't know me, you know I hate church marquees. They're trying to... If you don't love God, go to hell. Okay, let me come visit your church. Like, what were, like, what were you thinking? Like, here's, I mean, I, I'm going I'm to be honest. I, I got a couple for you. Can we just digress for a little bit? Because, you know, I'm, a, I'm ADHD and I can't stay on track. Here's probably one of my favorites. I keep this one forever. Thank you for letting me know. Like, right? Like, oh my. I want to know how many people walked in the church and be like, I had no idea that I was lost. Like, well, thanks for telling me. But is this where I'm supposed to be? Maybe the church next door? I don't know. But my all-time favorite, I'll bet their giving is through the roof, man. Like, I want to slap somebody. I'm just going to be honest with you. Are, you, are you. are you with me? Like, if you love God, show with your money. Yeah, let me just give you all my money, right? I just, I just don't understand it. So how did the Colossian church advertise their faith? They didn't have some marquee to put something real creative on, right? To just make people run in by the droves. No signs, no buildings, no tracks, no stickers on the back of their donkeys and all these things. There's kids in the room where I'd have gone KJV on that one, but I'm not going to, all right? If you don't know what I'm talking about, go look it up. But you want to know how they got their message out? They got their message in. When they got their message in, they were able to leave, live their message out. 
And let me just tell you, church, that is, that was, and still is the only credible way to have evangelism throughout our world. Live what you preach. So when he says, act wisely towards the outsiders making most of their time, understand who the outsiders are. They're the non-Christians. They're the people who don't know Christ. They're the people who don't believe in Christ. They're the people who, who think, man, I, I just don't, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to live like they live, right? And when he says making most of the time, understand here that he's not talking about chronos. He's not talking about time on your clock. The Greek word he uses is kairos, which means opportunity. And so when Paul says that, he's, what he's really saying is you should redeem every opportunity. Act wisely towards those who are not in the church because you have opportunities to show Jesus to those people. And when you act like a fool and you act like an idiot, you've lost the opportunity. And so don't just see verse 5 as one command. See verse 5 as two commands. Live wise to the outsiders so that you can make the most of the opportunities that you're given. Like that, that, that's our command. That, that's, what, that's what a good missionary is going to look like. Don't live like those who Gandhi watched. He said when he was asked why he wasn't a Christian, you know, Gandhi agreed with most Christian principles. And when he was asked why he didn't follow Christ, he said, because I've met too many people who do. Man, that breaks my heart. Do you realize that, that most non-Christians believe that Christians are hypocrites? Let me tell you how I know that. Because I did. As a non-Christian, I thought Christians were hypocrites, and I wanted nothing to do with them. I've got a friend who lives right here in this community who swears he will never step foot in the church because of the hypocrisy of Christians. Breaks my heart. And a lot of you in this room know it. So don't do dumb things. Here's the last one. Pretty simple. Don't say dumb things. You're like, Sean, are you sure? Well, let's look at verse 6. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you should answer each person. He's not talking about preaching the gospel here. Do you guys get that? Paul is talking about everyday conversations with other people. Let your speech always be gracious. Let, let it have grace in it. You know, we get so excited about vertical grace, but you know what we don't do a whole lot? We don't extend a lot of horizontal grace to other people. Like, we're thankful that we've got it, but we don't extend it out a lot. And so whether you're living a life where you're persecuted at work or at school or you're dealing with difficulty, you've been wrong, or your spouse makes you mad or your kids make you mad or, or whatever, he's saying, listen, let your speech always be gracious. How many of you go sit at a restaurant and you grab the salt immediately without, without even thinking of you just salt stuff, right? I'm one of those people, right? Because we like salt. We like the flavor. There's nothing worse than in inviting into something and there's no salt. Like there's, nothing, there's nothing worse. And so when he says this, he says, let your speech always be seasoned with salt. There's nothing worse than having you spew out of the mouth with no seasoning on it. Like I love how he's like, he's, he's using the times to understand, hey, without salt, stuff goes bad in their time. They didn't have refrigeration. So he understands that it's got to be salted. And listen to me, I've got to say this as a pastor, even though it's not going to help me win another popularity contest. But over the last few years, man, I have been mortified by some of the things that I see posted on social media for the whole world to see by professing Christians and even members of the churches that I've been on staff at. Do you guys realize that there, there's a family that I was on church that was at a, not anybody from here, listen, I'd have called you out by now if it was you, so just calm down. But... There was a family from another church that I had to literally finally block from my face. Christians just being hateful. And anytime I would post something, they'd just jump on my page and just start spewing hate. I finally blocked them. I was like, I can't deal with this anymore. We, when we're using words with hatred and vulgarity and gossip and slander and all these things, and I know some of you are probably like, well, that's legalism and you hate legalism. No, that's not legalism. 
That's called personal holiness. Like, don't forget the difference, right? Like, legalism is adding to what God's word says. It's preaching and saying rules that are not spelled out in the gospel, but you want it to help your agenda. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't see anywhere in the scriptures that it says that you can't dance. But I've seen a lot of Christians like, well, dancing is a sin. Maybe for white people, but I don't like that. <laughs> Maybe for President Trump. That is a sin. Like, that dude can't dance. Let's just stop, right? <laughs> I can't handle it, dude. But, but you get what I'm saying, right? It, it's all these things that where you're adding to the gospel, you're adding to the Bible because you want your agenda to go a little further. And instead, it should be personal holiness. And personal holiness is what Paul's talked about a lot throughout Colossians. And it's taking serious the commands of Scripture. When Scripture says, hey, you shouldn't do this, guess what? You shouldn't do it. When Scripture says, hey, you should do this, guess what? You should do it. That's what we're talking about. And so when he says, let your speech be gracious, seasoned with salt, and you tweet or post or all these other things, things that are not saturated with grace, that's a personal holiness issue. It's not a legalistic issue. That's a personal holiness issue because it's clearly spelled out in the text that we should do. And so I hadn't been able to figure out how we profess to have the Holy Spirit literally dwelling inside of us. Yet we still spew hatred and we keep score and all these things. Church, don't forget what Jesus did for you. He didn't keep score. Praise God. Right? Praise God he didn't keep score. So verse 6, it means, let your mouth speak what is, speak what is spiritual, what's wholesome, what's fitting, what's kind and sensitive, and go down the list and all those things. Don't ruin a chance to share the gospel with somebody because you've already ruined it with your speech. And so the question that remains and would die is whether or not you and I are called to be missionaries. Because let's be honest, we think of a missionary, we can think of somebody who sells their house, sells everything they own, they jump on a plane, they go to some other foreign country, right? That's not it. We are missionaries. So the question shouldn't be, are, are we called to be missionaries? We are. We are called to go and reach people for the gospel. That's the way heaven grows, right? The question we have to ask is whether or not we're effective with this. How do these three principles help us to become more effective missionaries? The mission is living it out every single day. With a mindset that you're going to be gospel-focused. Gospel-centered, gospel-driven through my thoughts, through my prayers, that everything I do is going to be focused on, I want the gospel to advance. So before I send out that next tweet, is this going to help or hinder the gospel? You guys know I post a lot on Facebook. What you don't know is I delete a lot on Facebook before it actually gets views, right? Because I'm human. Let's just be honest. There's certain things that I just want to lose my marbles about. And I'll post it sometimes, and I'll just take it down real quick. I'm like, maybe it just felt good to post it. I don't know. The missions is redeeming the opportunities around you by living a life that is credible to the Christ that you proclaim to reflect. Let's do that. But listen to me. If we're truly going to become effective missionaries, then first and foremost, we've got to decide that we're on mission with God and first. And that starts with admitting you're a sinful person, believing that God raised Jesus from the dead, and confessing your sins. In other words, that starts with salvation. You can't be on mission with God until you agree with him that, yes, I'm a sinful person and I need saved. And so maybe you're here today and you say, well, I've never surrendered my life to Jesus. Let me tell you, that's the first step. To becoming an effective missionary. Let's pray together.